for the ISY seminar uh, today. Uh, uh, it's very exciting to have Professor Yunan Liu from uh, North Carolina State University visiting us. Uh, so uh, yes, yeah, so Professor Liu uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Industrial Systems Engineering at NCSU. And he obtained his uh, B degree from, in electrical engineering from Xinhua and MS and PhD degree in IUR at Columbia University. Uh, his uh, research interests include uh, stochastic modeling, applied probability, simulation, cubing theory, optimal control, and online learning uh, with applications to uh, customer contact centers, healthcare, production, blockchain, and transportation systems. So kind of very versatile. Uh, and uh, his work on staffing service systems with varying time varying demand uh, was awarded the first place in the INFORMS uh, junior faculty interscope paper competition in 2016. Uh, so uh, exciting work. And so we are very excited to have him join us. Uh, and uh, thanks, uh, Professor Yunan, for accepting our uh, invitation. So today you will uh, tell us about uh, online learning approach to pricing and capacity sizing in service systems. So whenever you are ready. Oh, thank you so much, Chris, for uh, inviting me to give a seminar and also for organizing such a nice seminar series and for introducing me. Uh, I'm very happy to talk about this problem I have been working on in the past few years, uh, online learning approach to um, uh, operational decisions in service system queuing systems. This is a joint work with uh, my colleague Xin Yun Chen and uh, Gui Yu Hong from uh, Chinese University in Hong Kong. Uh, Chris has already given a very nice introduction for, for my background. I just want to emphasize on one thing. So the queuing part uh, is focused. Uh, so my queuing uh, research focuses more on the realistic side of queuing models, having uh, time bearing arrivals, non exponential service times, uh, multi class customers, and uh, where I do uh, staffing and scheduling using heavy traffic analysis as a tool, uh, such as fluid and diffusion approximations. And uh, recent year, in the in the in the past of several years, I've begun working on using online learning in queuing systems. So I also I've also began teaching uh, reinforcement learning and online learning related courses. Okay. Uh, so uh, before we uh, jump into the detailed setting of this problem, I'd like to give a more like a high level personal view of how online learning benchmark with uh, the conventional queuing approach. So. Uh, as a queuing theorist, right? Whenever we have a queuing model, you know, we, we, we construct and solve a stochastic optimization problem. But first, we need to have some model parameters, such as the arrival rate, the service rate, the service distribution, G, and so on and so forth. So based on this, we, we solve a stochastic uh, optimization problem, which is based on the parameter. And we estimate, we compute the expectation, distribution of queue lengths, waiting time, and abandonment, and so on. And later we, we devise st st uh, staffing and scheduling decisions uh, with the objective of minimizing a cost or maximizing a profit and so on. But there's one thing we, we don't often do is the upper stream. So in order to obtain these parameters, lambda, mu, and g, we need some data. We need to use data such as arrival counts, service times, abandonment times to fit these parameters, right? So we often focus on stage two, where we completely trust the, pre the precision of these parameters and we use them and solve this problem, right? So there's also a missing step, stage one, statistical fitting, which is to fit or learn the model. So if we want to uh, put this into practice, then we have to carry, you know, we have to start with stage one and we have to finish the whole thing with stage two. Uh, this, these steps, uh, the main problem is that uh, you may have insufficient historical data to calibrate your model parameters, such as lambda or mu. And the other thing is the solution fidelity, you know, at the end, we may suffer from significant uh, statistical error of input parameters, especially when we're in heavy traffic. So let me uh, explain this using a very simple story using MM1Q. So everybody knows that. MM1Q has two parameters, uh, arrival rate lambda and a service rate mu, right? So this is a, uh, in any uh, queuing theory 101 class, uh, the class would introduce these formulas, steady state waiting time and a steady state queue length, right? That is a function, very simple function of a lambda, mu, and a rho, that is the traffic intensity, uh, which, of, which is assumed to be less than one for stability. Such a formula is so nice, 
because it provides a quantification and also a structural result telling us how the system congestion level measured by the Q lens is increasing as the traffic intensity approaches one, right? Very nice formula. But the problem is when the system is, is close to heavy traffic, one row is close to one, a tiny bit of estimation error in one of those parameters, such as in Lambda, will incur a very large uh, error in this formula, right? For example, if mu is fixed at one and uh, you have Lambda close to 0.99, if you misestimate Lambda by 5%, right? So I, I increase Lambda by 5%. The formula is not gonna be 5% different, it's two times, right? So whenever the system is in heavy traffic, uh, you know, the solution and the performance metric can be highly sensitive to a, even a small error in this um, per, um, parameter estimation stage. So, however, this stage, so this is the problem, right? So this part, because we have this extra layer, so the error in this, er in this part will exaggerate throughout the process until the end, right? In a nonlinear way. So this is a All potential, right. yes. So... At a high level, I totally agree that in heavy traffic, this is going to be sensitive to estimates. But mathematically, I'm confused because if I miss forecast by 5% the arrival rate, it seems like I no longer have a steady state. Now lambda is bigger than mu. So maybe I'm misunderstanding this second calculation you did? Uh, I think, I think uh, this is just a wrong calculation. So I want to make sure. So this is a, a bad example, though. I realize what you're saying. So if I add 5%, this may be greater than 1. So I think I, I need to make up a better example so that even you increase 5%, you're still in the st stable region. But I, want to, I just want to illustrate the idea here. You know, I, I just realized this is, this is a bad example. OK, great. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is, yeah, I never realized that. I just made up this. But, uh, but you can see the, the nonlinear transformation here. So, a potential solution for this is online learning. So, we use data to estimate performance metrics, such as Q length, waiting time, and the abandonment. And we, we further make use of these estimated performance metrics to make decisions, such as staffing, scheduling, and routing. And we put them in use to generate data through the exploration phase. So right now I'm, I'm starting to use uh, terminologies in reinforcement learning uh, and use this, these decisions to generate data such as arrival count, service times, and this data will be used again to improve uh, my scheduling, staffing, and routing decisions, right? So this is going to be a loop self-evolving process. So this is the essential idea of online learning or reinforcement learning. So you can see that one step is omitted here. The parameter calibration step is omitted here. This extra layer is removed from the whole process. So that's the key benefit, right? Because we, we, we may have a potential error generated from this S, uh, stage, but now we're not using this part. We're directly, Sorry. yes. Go Sorry, ahead. I have a question here. Yeah. So, um, well, maybe a couple of questions, but closely related. So I understand the sensitivity issue when um like service rate arrival rate are similar then you know small differences in estimation can lead to very different behavior mm -hmm. um potentially also though couldn't that lead i mean couldn't that just show up as a sensitivity issue somewhere else in your model like if i get some policy a little bit wrong that will either blow up or not blow up like aren't you wouldn't this just push the sensitivity issue somewhere else? And the related question is that, I mean, mm -hmm. machine learning methods, they don't exactly do statistical fitting, but they still have to do, they kind of do it in some sense implicitly. So based on that perspective, I also don't see how this would avoid this sensitivity issue. It seems to me like it would just move it somewhere else. Oh, no. Yeah. So, so right now, so before, right, we had two stages. So we had to translate data into parameter and later mm -hmm. we translate parameter into say delay, right? Most of our effort has been concentrating on this translation here, right? That, so that even that part is not, is not easy, right? So given a lambda and a mu, you know, what is the delay in a, in a more complex queuing system? So we're, we're aiming at a more direct translation from data to, 
to performance formula or decision variables by skipping this area, this, uh, this particular layer. So okay. I, I don't think I, I completely get your question. Uh, you know, I'm... Okay, that's, that's fine. Maybe it will make more sense later. Okay. And maybe my question will be answered later in the presentation anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, so if I, sorry, uh, maybe yeah. uh, just to go back to the example and uh, to kind of respond to Nick. So, I mean, I think, uh, uh, I mean, your calculation would be correct if it's a 0.5% error. Right. That, right? And, uh, but, but also sort of illustrates how stark the error. Yeah. Is. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I need to reduce this a little bit, but still you will see a significant uh, increase in, in on the right side. To make it to make to make sense, more sense of it, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So this is the idea on a high level, uh, the potential benefit of online learning. So it's good at learning from scratch with no prior data. It omits the model learning part. But so the idea is to directly learn the policy rather than building a model. Uh, and uh, in heavy traffic, uh, this is beneficial because it address the it may address the sensitivity issue. Right, as illustrated in the previous example. And when we're not in heavy traffic, when the optimal solution does not put the system in heavy traffic, the commonly used heavy traffic analysis would be inaccurate because the heavy traffic analysis has been a common tool for people to solve um, queuing, the queuing problems, right? Queuing problems are hard. So uh, analytic solution, exact solutions are usually not available. So heavy traffic becomes inaccurate when we're not in heavy traffic solution, heavy traffic regime. So we may be good in both cases, right? So this is my view on the high level. And uh, so let's talk about this detailed problem, online pricing and the staffing in queues. So we consider a queuing model where arrivals have to pay a fee to join, right? And uh, if a customer joins, a customer wait in a queue for an amount of a time and uh, later got served and depart. So uh, uh, the motivation are, are many. Um, and the service provider aims to pick the right P, the service fee and the capacity mu in order to maximize the expected profit, which is um, carefully defined on the next page. So here P and the mu are uh, decisions of the service provider. So in, uh, specifically we consider GG1Q, a single server GG1Q where uh, the interval times are ID having a service rate lambda, which is a function of P. So here we assume lambda P to be decreasing in P and uh, there's also some smooth and convex condition imposed on the lambda. And the service times are ID, generally distributed with the service rate mu. So here P and the mu are decisions. The service provider aims to solve a pricing and staffing problem by maximizing the, the long run rate profit, which is equal to P times lambda P uh, the unit price times the, the rate at which customers are willing to join under P minus a congestion cost minus a staffing cost. The congestion cost is measured by uh, the expectation of the steady state, uh, the steady state Q length under the PNMU, the current decision, minus the staffing cost. So here C is a increasing and convex function of the service capacity mu. So here P and the mu has a support, P lower bar and the P upper bar, and so, so is mu. So this problem is not new. This problem has been studied by previous literature. For example, in uh, a paper, two papers actually, by Chi uh, Hong uh, Li and Amy Ward in 2014 and 2019. They studied this paper, uh, problem. Uh, they assume full knowledge of Lambda, but still there is no analytic solution due to the sophisticated structure of the D1Q, right? So there is no analytic solution uh, to uh, the steady state waiting time for the GG1Q or for more general queues. So what they did there was a heavy traffic approach by sending row to one, and they used fluid and a diffusion approximation to asymptotically solve this, right? So that's a little bit of history there. We aim to solve this problem using the online learning approach. So uh, this is a commonly used uh, flow chart for reinforcement learning classes. So here, putting this into that context, uh, the agent refers to uh, the service provider and the environment here means anything that is beyond the knowledge boundary of the agent, right? So the, that includes the stochastic external demand and the, the complex internal queuing dynamics. 
So basically, when the agent is changing the decision P and the mu by a little bit, what is the response from the environment? Well, that environment is complex. It, it includes everything beyond the knowledge of, of the agent. So this is a iterative algorithm where the, the decision P and the mu evolves from period to period. So the, the, uh, the service provider would try PT and the mu T for some amount of time to generate data, including the queue lengths, the number of customers who are willing to join under P and the mu, and the delay uh, experienced by each of the customers. Based on this information, based on this data, uh, the agent would improve the P and the mu to PT plus one and mu T plus one and enter the next cycle, right? So this is, this is the uh, general framework. Uh, to measure the effectiveness of this approach, we, we use uh, the so-called regret that is understood as the cost to pay over time or the number of samples for the algorithm to, to learn the optimal policy. Right. So, so this, this is a common, commonly used term in the literature of online learning. All right. So, uh, to be more specific, we consider uh, cycles indexed by t, uh, a k. Uh, there are two phases in each cycle. There's the exploration phase, and there's the exploitation phase. Uh, okay. So, we first apply the control parameter p k and the mu k for a duration t k, which is the length of the cycle. We collect the data on the system performance generated during TK under PK and MUK. Data includes realized demand, waiting time information, and so on. And we, we enter the exploitation phase by using the data to evolve the current policy to a better policy, right? So, so PK plus one and MUK plus one is some kind of function of the previous policy along with the data generated under PK and MUK, right? That's, that's the sort of a, the main uh, flow. And the main, okay, so what, what are the main challenges of online learning queues? Well, first thing is that, you know, queuing is unique uh, in many ways. A queue, uh, so unbounded state space is one, and a system stability is, a, is, is the other feature, right? And transient performance, a non stationary error is also a difficulty uh, in this uh, online learning regret analysis. For example, here, I have sort of achieved the steady state using PK and MUK but I need to update them to uh, PK plus one and MUK plus one, that would break the steady state structure and make the system enter a transient phase. So the transient phase contribute to the overall regret uh, in some degree, right? So there's, there is a transient error that we have to bound. So um, that's, that's a significant uh, analysis in the regret analysis. Okay. Um, so uh, a quick question. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, sorry, Uncle. No, right. Uh, uh, so it's uh, so TK is the duration of the exploration phase, uh, and yeah. uh, but but that is not the cycle length, cycle duration, or is it different? Uh, we we actually have two terms to describe the cycle duration. One is the the time. The other one is the number of customer we serve during a period that we call that DK. So either can be considered the length of the cycle. So it seems like, uh, I mean, so I'm sort of trying to understand the exploitation phase. So I think that at the end of the cycle, you're going to evaluate. Uh, yeah. But is there a period of time where you are not exploring and ex like exploiting something? Like what is exactly is happening? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, exploitation takes no time. Exploration takes the time, TK. And at the end of it, we're going to gather all the information we collect and, uh, uh, under this policy during TK and we devise a way to upgrade uh, to like update PK mu K to PK plus one mu K plus one. So exploiting there is so exploitation phase. I mean there is no phase called exploitation. Center. Right. So this is this is probably bad wording. Uh, so there is no time there. It is not like the the, the period has been divided into two uh, period. It's just a a step. Okay. So essentially, this algorithm is always exploring. And it's just periodically it is updating PK and UK. Is that right? Well, so probably um, you actually, when you choose this, like this psi, this uh, updating policy, probably mm -hmm. you're actually balancing the exploration and exploitation, right? I think constantly you're doing some balance of both. 
I don't think yeah. you, there's really distinct phases there, but you don't necessarily want to do a myopic policy either. I think you're constantly really doing kind of both or some balance of each. Yeah, th so, so putting this in context to reinforce learning, this is a batch learning uh, frame. So if you talk about Monte Carlo, you, you explore until the end of the, the episode, then you gather all the information and you devise a estimator, right, by Monte Carlo. So that, that, that is, this is in that sense, like a batch update, not the, the temporal difference type. So, so TK is a, is a decision or? It's a decision, hyperparameter. Okay, and you need TK to be long enough, right, to establish some steady state? Yes. Status? Yes. And that could be uh, a long time, right? Yeah. And so the way this would get implemented, in, like in practice, if you have a real system, is that you'll be playing around with with PK and mu K? We uh, we in in the regret analysis, we have to optimize TK in order to minimize the order of the regret. So the later I'll sh I'll show that the regret upper bound is a logarithm of K. And uh, the, the corresponding TK would grow also in the log sense. So, so, right. So, so. Yeah. I'm just asking about how sort of practical is this approach. Let's say I have some kind of a service system, like a call center, mm -hmm. some kind, or some other, I don't know, some other service, I guess, where you pay. And I mean, how, how practical is it to actually do this? This is a great question, though. Um, in order to make this work in the theory, we, we have to let TK grow, um, you know, to infinity in a, in an order. But in our numerical analysis, we can let TK be a constant, and it still converges pretty pretty nicely. Because because what we do here is to establish an upper bound for the regret. That is sort of a, some kind of a worst case analysis. So everything we we do here is a little bit conservative. Okay. So, so just to clarify, you know, I, I, Chris, thanks for asking the question already. Um, so now I understand that uh, TK is just the update frequency, and there are no two phases in in such. You are right, right. doing the same thing, just uh, using the opt the policy that you think consider to be optimal at the moment, but you update that policy after you have some information, and you want to make sure that there is not in the, there is uh, sufficient data so that this, so there's some smoothness in updates. That's why you want to TK to be sufficiently large. Yes, yes. I apologize for the, the bad choice of my wording. So okay. this is this is an analog of the Monte Carlo estimate, um, mm -hmm. Monte Carlo learning method where you, you update in batches. Sure. Yes, and yes. What, what, one more clarification, uh, just make sure that we have, a, you have a, look, uh, considering a stationary system, right? Uh, this is non-stationary. Whenever you update your parameter, you change no, no, the price. No, no. I, mean, I mean, the underlying um, statistics of the system are stationary. The arrival process and the uh, service uh, service time uh, service time distribution they are fixed right oh yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but that depends okay. on your parameter it's but a gg1 it's, it's a gg1q right? it's a gg1q yes uh, but the rate the but the but the first order information of the both the gis are are changing uh, according to your policy um yeah, but once you set the policy, it's yeah. it's GG one, yes. the yes. standard GG one. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, here is a uh, incomplete literature review. So we have two bodies of literature. One is uh, the body of literature on pricing and capacity sizing in queues, where no learning is used. Right. So, uh, so this, so you can see that this type of problem goes all the way back. There are so many. Uh, uh, researchers focusing on these type of problems. We especially want to focus on uh, reviewing this literature, GG1Q in heavy traffic by Lee and Award in 2014, and uh, the extension with the customer abandonment in 2019 by the same authors. They try to solve this problem using heavy traffic results, and they assume with full knowledge there's no learning. So they use fluid and diffusion approximation to asymptotically solve this problem. Uh, so here, the second bullet point reviews uh, the small but growing uh, body of literature on online learning in queues. So, so this first work, it develops a 
uh, reinforcement learning method for more general queuing networks with uh, unbounded states. And uh, this set of authors, they consider scheduling in a discrete time queuing setting with unknown service rate. So the service rate is unknown, right? So if you don't know the service rate, for example, if you have a multi-class scheduling problem and you know, if you do know the service rate, CMU rule is optimal. But if you don't know mu, how do you know which what is the, what, right? What is the, what is the right CMU? So that's one of the work that they did. So all of these works they assume unknown service rate, but they consider a discrete time uh, framework where uh, you know an indiscrete time point a customer arrives geometrically and the service completion occurs also geometrically. So at each time, a uh, small time step, you flip a coin to decide if the customer finishes service. Therefore, the total service duration is geometric distribution. There's also a pricing in Markovian multi-server queue uh, and also an optimal control uh, using actor critic algorithm in queuing networks by Jim Dye and uh, Grossman. So these are all very recent papers. So I, I think, I think uh, my understanding is that uh, online learning in queue is quite new uh, in the queuing literature. Okay, so here is the detailed definition of a regret. So TK is the length of a period K. And N is the total number of arrival uh, in period K. So, so NK is the number of arrival and N, uh, capital NK is the cumulative total number by, uh, by K. And the WI is the social time of customer I. And the regret is R as a function of L where L is the total number of the period cycles experienced by the service provider. So we are benchmarking with the Oracle problem. The Oracle problem is this problem right here. And the optimal solution to the Oracle problem is called the Oracle solution P star and mu star. That is used as a benchmark, right? So we, we never outperform the Oracle problem, right? So this, this thing is always positive and we're studying the growth of it as L increases, right? So this is the cumulative regret or say the performance, uh, the profit deficit uh, under the current uh, learning algorithm, right? So here, uh, if we admit one customer under PK, we collect PK, right? But uh, we're penalizing uh, by uh, a waiting cost. So H is, H is the unit waiting cost per customer per time unit, subtracting the staffing cost under uh, decision mu K for this amount of period, right? This is the total time. So this is our uh, definition of the regret. And we're taking the expectation of it. Uh, the objective is to devise a good algorithm so that PK and MUK would converge eventually to P star and new star, the Oracle, the Oracle solution to the Oracle problem uh, as K increases and the regret should not grow so fast. So eventually we will show that the upper bound of the regret is uh, logarithm. That's, that's the idea. So we, we have two algorithms in two papers. One algorithm is to assume full knowledge of Lambda. As I said, right, if, even if you have the demand curve Lambda P, you still don't have analytic solution, right? And the second algorithm assumes that the Lambda is unknown, completely unknown. So uh, Yunan, uh, yes. may I interrupt please? Could you go back to yes. the previous slide? Sure. So, so this regret definition is uh, in the adversarial setting for all possible mm -hmm. P star and mu star? No, uh, P star mu star is the optimal solution. Oh, uh, sorry, yes, yes. Okay, to, okay. To, to this problem. Oh. Yeah, for, for all, all possible um, lambda functions and all possible mu's, uh, so all possible lambda functions. But lambda is a function of P, is P right? P oh, no, just, just for, for a given lambda function. So in the first algorithm, we assume okay. we also know that lambda. And in the second algorithm, we assume we do not know that lambda. But, uh, okay. Okay. You, but this problem, if you are given the lambda, somehow if you manage to solve this and P star and mu star would be the solution to this problem. Okay, okay. Yeah. So the regret is for a given lambda, you, you know the lambda function, and then you are trying to solve this problem. Yeah, so uh, with or without the information of lambda, it, the regret is always defined like this. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Okay. It's just uh, in the first algorithm, we make use of the, the knowledge of lambda, and in the second algorithm, we do not make use of the, the knowledge of lambda. Okay, okay. Yeah, even, even we have the lambda structure, we still don't have analytic solution. That's, that's, that's really uh, the highlight here. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so maybe uh, to uh, 
highlight this. So in the case when lambda is known, there is no like there is no possible there is no meaningful sense in which you can provide a lower bound, right? Because like obviously an algorithm that implements p star and mu star will get uh, the no regret. So, but yeah. in the case where a lambda is unknown and maybe belonging to some class, uh, you can think of like providing a lower bound. So is that like? Is that something uh, that you can talk about or are going to talk yeah, about later? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if there's if the lambda is available, uh, so so okay. So in the first algorithm, we assume lambda is available yeah. and we make use of the structure of a lambda and device and algorithm. It's still data driven. So what do we what do we have here is the data generated by the current policy along with the structure of lambda, right? Uh, because we don't know the exact solution, we don't know this. This these are not analytically solvable. So we are not, this is always going to be positive. So we establish an upper bound, which is a logarithm. Um, we, okay, so I, I think what you're asking is that, why do we need this if we have Lambda, right? Um, so as I mentioned, even if Lambda is available, you can only asymptotically solve it. And this solution may not be very good when the scale is not too large or one row is not close to one. So numerical solution shows that in some settings, you know, a heavy traffic solution is not good. Uh, and so the learning-based approach would give you a more accurate solution than the heavy traffic solution. So, uh, uh, yeah. But yeah. if I know Lambda, then can't I perfectly simulate the system and learn offline? Sure, In yeah. which case, why do I care about regret? Because in theory, if I know Lambda exactly, I maybe I apply your algorithm offline Mm -hmm. It converges to P star and mu star mm -hmm. now, and I do that all in simulation, and then I can apply that online. Well, the, right? the, what we highlight here is online, right? So online learning applies to the setting where revenue matters. So simulating online means interacting with the market and generating profit. So you spend a lot of effort generating lamb to generate lambda, but you're losing revenue. So the goal here, if we're talking about online, is to learn the optimum policy in the quickest way with the smallest regret loss, the, the, the revenue loss. I guess that makes sense to me if Lambda is not known, but it doesn't make sense to me if Lambda is known. But, it doesn't make sense to me to apply a policy online, um, like a suboptimal policy online when Lambda is known. But I mean, yeah. I guess it makes sense to start with that case is maybe simpler, but yeah, to me, I think the unknown case is a lot more compelling sure, yeah. as an yeah, yeah. example of online learning. Yeah, I agree with you. The online case is more more interesting uh, because because you know uh, if you fit lambda, it would take a lot of effort and you will lose a lot of profit. So that is the more uh, that's the case that is matters uh, more more making this approach more effective. Yes. Yeah, just to add that if lambda is known, this is a computational pro problem. It's yes. not a learning problem at all. Right? Uh, you, you, you can definitely do that. Um, it's just uh, the original way. We, we have two algorithms both presented in the same paper, though, but the paper got too long, so we separated it into two papers. <laughs> uh, but uh, I agree with you. The unknown case is more interesting. Yes. But you, but you still don't know the distribution, right? I mean, you know the, you know the, the, the functional form of lambda. But the GG one has right, yeah, yeah. You need to specify the distribution of arrival process and the service process, and those are unknown. Those are arbitrary. Uh, the assumption we make on these distributions are I don't know, is there a light, light tail? No, uh, but so, do, you, do you assume knowledge? No, those? no, no, even for the known case, we don't assume knowledge of the distribution, so that could be a benefit. That could be so, uh, so there's learning in that sense, right? You're learning yes. the distribution. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that, that yeah, makes yeah. a lot more sense actually. Yeah. 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 So you couldn't simulate. Yeah. So, so you um, yeah. So the unknown things, even if lambda is known, there's still unknown things you have to learn. Which yeah. Yeah. yeah so okay. uh in this heavy traffic analysis, uh um they have to assume some knowledge of the distribution beyond the first order. For example, they, they need the, the precise information of the second order, the, the variance of the arrival process and the service times. So that's something we don't assume here. Yeah, thank you, thank you.
yeah, so we, we, we will begin with this easy case, right? When lambda is known. Uh, so here, uh, what the algorithm looks like. So uh, so this uh, so here, uh, because of um, the complexity, so uh, I'm assuming mu is fixed, only p is the decision now. But of course, everything can be generalized to the two, two, uh, the two decisions. So mu is fixed, right? So p, you pick an initial p, and you get into this loop. You run the GG1Q in the case cycle for this amount of time under p. And you generate this data. Data include the number of customers who join under P, observed data, uh, the, uh, the waiting time experienced by each of the customer, and the busy time uh, of, of the server, and so on. So this is the observe the busy time. So this B, uh, observe the busy time by each customer. So this W and the B and the N are all considered part of the data that, it, that, that are used to device uh, a updating procedure. So here the HK is a gradient estimate. So you can see that this is a stochastic gradient descent algorithm, right? So I, I, before I had a pi implicitly transforming the PK mu k uh, along with the data to the PK plus one mu k plus one. Uh, you can see that this pi is in form of a gradient descent. Okay, so this algorithm has two, uh, actually three hyperparameters, the length of the cycle TK, the ETK, which is the learning rate for the SGD, and the epsilon k that is used here to discard some initial data at the beginning of the cycle to avoid too much of a you know non-stationarity bias because at the beginning of the cycle you switch policies so the system enters a uh, transient period right so you have to control so in order to reduce the bias in that you you, you discard some some warm up data so we only use the rest of the data here. So these three parameters are something we play with in order to achieve a good regret bound. Okay. Um, okay. So the main model assumptions, uh, I, I leave out the details, but uh, we have to assume convexity and smoothness. You know, SGD, stochastic gradient descent converge requires, convergence requires this uniform stability. So the system is stable for all uh, possible choices of the P and the mu. In order to guarantee a uh, ergo, uh, strong ergodicity of the GG1Q. And here is the explicit choice of the hyperparameters. So TK is the length of the period K. It has to be in the order of a logarithm of K. And the ETK is the learning rate of SGD, is in the order of one over K. So it's getting smaller and smaller. And uh, it turns out that epsilon doesn't matter as long as it's strictly between zero and one. So epsilon is this warm up part. So you. So I think in our algorithm, we, we let uh, epsilon k be 20% uh, or something, but uh, theoretically it doesn't matter. So when you say yes. convexity and smoothness here, what are you assuming is- kind of, of the objective yeah. function. Okay. And is that true in general or- it, uh, it can be verified for some cases such as, uh, you know, MG1, and some GG1 with high, uh, phase type distributions of service and uh, interval times, but it, uh, it's hard to verify for more general GG1 queues. Yeah, so it probably would not be true for GG1, or do you conjecture that it's true for GG1, just hard to prove? Uh, it's hard to prove. It's hard to prove. We have to, we have to assume that in order to guarantee okay. the convergence. Yes. So it, to, to address to address this issue, we had to give some examples using um, phase type distributed uh, interval times for GG1 as it, to show, okay, this is actually justifiable. But we're unable to justify this for general GG1 queues. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. This is very good uh, question. So um, under this setting, so the MK is the, the total time, right? So TK is the length of each K, uh, period. So the MK is the total time up to the case period. Oh, this is should be J here. And uh, we are able to uh, show that uh, the decision converges to the Oracle decision. Of course, everything is generalizable to the two, pro two so PK and mu K converting to P star and mu star and under the same uh, hyperparameter order. And the regret is in this order, the logarithm of the total time square. So it's a square of the log. We don't have a lower bound here because um, the upper bound is established using existing results on the strong ergodicity of GG1Q. So that is an upper bound of the rate of convergence of the GG1Q. There is there exists no <laughs> result in the literature on the lower bound of the convergence rate of GG1Q. That's, that's the problem. Here. 
But uh, we consider this upper bound, the logarithm uh, regret order to be pretty good, right? So you know the log is, is already quite, quite good. So, uh, so the main idea of the proof uh, is explained on this page. So I leave out all the details. The regret is decomposed into two pieces, R1L and R2L. And R1L represent the regret due to suboptimality. And R2L uh, is due to the regret due to non-stationarity. So we subtract and add a term so that this, this first term represents the Oracle problem under the Oracle decision minus the Oracle problem under the current decision. This is the suboptimality error. And the other one is under the current decision PK, the Oracle payoff minus you know, the transient payoff. So that's a non-stationary error. We had to work with both terms. We have to bound both terms, especially the first term. We separate this into several pieces. For example, you can see that here, this term involves the bias of our gradient estimator. And, we and this term involves the variance of the gradient estimator. And we have to pick our uh, hyperparameters carefully in here in order to um, uh, balance the orders of all three and minimize them. So that's, that's how we obtain these, these orders. So we, we conduct an optimization analysis in here. We select these parameters to uh, balance the orders and minimize the orders. That's how we did it. Yeah, so the, the details is it's, it's technical, but this is the high level idea. So let me show you a numerical example using the standard MM1Q. So uh, uh, the arrival rate is picked to be a logic function. Uh, uh, so it's a common uh, use of uh, example in the um, revenue management uh, literature. So it's, uh, it's actually non-convex and it's decreasing. And uh, the upper bound is 10 and the lower bound is zero. Uh, you know, this is MM1, right? So everything is analytic. So we, because we do have the analytic results, so we are able to um, graph the regret by, by benchmarking the, 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 the exact solution and the um, simulated algorithm solution. So solving the Oracle problem gives the P star that is 3.5. So you can see that this is, this is the demand curve and this is the objective function. And you know, the optimizer is here, 3.5. Non-convex though, right? That's non-convex. Uh, we, we don't have to assume full convexity. We, have, we just have to have, I think, uni model. So I wasn't, I wasn't very um, uh, rigorous earlier. So uh, this part uh, is, the, is the optimal point. And you can see that the optimal traffic intensity under P star is not close to heavy traffic. So the Oracle problem does not give you a solution that put the system in heavy traffic, right? So, you know, if you use the heavy traffic result, it's, it's not gonna be very accurate. So here, uh, the graph illustrate the uh, sample path of the gradient, the price sequence, of course, this is, this, is the, this is the single decision variable problem, right? So here mu is fixed, mu is 10. And later I'll show you a, um, the case where mu and, uh, and p are both optimized. And this is the demand curve, oh, sorry, regret curve. And this is just a, a linear regression of the square of R. So we, we did the linear regression of this curve because we wanna fit uh, you know, square root of R to be a linear function so that we are in this form. So we're trying to estimate the, the big C in front of this O. So we have the C and the D estimated by working with this graph, right? To, to, to make more sense of the theoretical uh, order of the regret, right? So, so eventually, you know, when, when, uh, when M is large enough, it's, it's sort of a linear function like that. So, so for a linear function, we, we, we estimate the two parameters C and D. So in this example, how long does it take to get close to the optimal solution? Well, uh, the X horizon is a total number, uh, it's, it's a total time. So you experience some significant regret increase at the beginning, but it, it flats out later. So, so this is already, this is computed by benchmarking with that, uh, you know, uh, optimal solution. So this is already the difference. So, um, so the thing is, uh, the philosophy of online learning does not quantify the time it takes, 
but rather focusing on the order of the regret growth. Yeah, I mean, I understand that. But if you're if you're trying to implement this approach in practice, right? Sure, sure. You cannot um, experiment forever, right? right? Right. You're running some service system, right? Yeah. You eventually need to settle on a price, right? You don't have that luxury of, I don't know, experimenting for a year or two years or whatever, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. uh, I'm trying to get a sense from you if I'm now going to take this and run it on some service, <laughs> right? W- what should I expect? Uh, in this example, though, if you look at the top right corner here, the price sequence uh, is close to the Oracle price, which is the red dash line uh, somewhere here. Though we, right. we, we intentionally chose a P that is far from the red line and we let it evolve uh, for a little bit. Uh, so this is 10 cycle, approximately 10 cycle. So this the is the length, cycle. And the length of a cycle is? Uh, the length of cycle is not given here, but uh, it's uh, yeah. So I don't have the details here. I think. Yeah, I, yeah. Think... I mean, my my question is more a practical one. Okay. Okay. Let's say uh, I'm I don't know I'm running a, a call center, and you come to me with this exciting new approach, <laughs> or I don't know maybe call center you don't charge prices, but some other service where you charge prices. Mm-hmm. Um, right. I don't know an amusement park where you're charging people to enter or something right yeah so yeah yeah what, what is, yeah what what is this i mean how yeah can can you can you comment at a high level at the practicality of this approach um we don't have an absolute uh, quantification for this but we did run uh, a set of um, sensitivity analysis of the convergence speed by varying the system parameters so i have a figure to show you actually two slides later so uh, maybe let me explain this a little bit, and then then hopefully this will answer your question more or less. Sure. So yeah. Sure. So one quick uh, one critical question is that how do we benchmark this, uh, which we call the Golic uh, gradient based online learning in Q algorithm uh, with the hypertrophic solution? So um, Golic is a robust, more robust to the system scale, while hypertrophic requires n go to infinity or rho goes to one. Uh, you know, it depends on the system inf- uh, distribution information to a lesser uh, extent, uh, because online, uh, traffic traffic solution requires distributional information. Uh, we, we're better in the longer time frame. Of course, we also, you know, as you said, you know, you want you care about the speed of convergence in a shorter time frame. Uh, yeah. So here, we run a set of experiment by varying model parameters to gain a better insight of the advantage of Golic. Uh, so we discovered that uh, this algorithm works better when the staffing cost is higher and the service variability is, is bigger, which is measured by the so-called squared coefficient of variation. That is the variance of the service time divided by the, the square of the mean. So uh, here are um, the, uh, the graphs. So uh, the X horizon is the, is the time horizon. And uh, this uh, blue curve is the learning curve, the, the regret. Well, we know that hypertrophic is an approximation, so the regret is always linear. It's never, it's never going to be zero because hypertrophic approach is approximating approach. It doesn't evolve; it's static, so it will grow linearly. And really, the comparison lies in this intersection point. When can we catch up with it? Right. So because we're getting better and better, so we're close to optimality, so we don't grow that much afterwards. So if you look at the, the top row where we fix all the other parameters, but we vary the staffing cost uh, from 0.5 to 2. Then we can see that we're doing better. Uh, we, we, we catch up with uh, the other approach faster. And in the, mi- the middle panel, uh, we fixed everything, but we vary the service variability. The, the more variable system we, we're, uh, is more beneficial. I mean, uh, the, uh, is more, uh, the, the online learning becomes more advantage. As we, so we, we quickly catch up with the um, heavy traffic. And lastly, the, of course, the scale. When the system is in large scale, we're not that good because the heavy traffic is already pretty good. So, so, so it takes a longer time to get there. But if the system is far from large scale, you know, we have some advantage. Uh, but still, none of these would be quantitative. All of these are qualitative. Um, we don't. We don't. We don't. We did not report in absolute time at which we we uh, we 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 uh, we are close to optimality. 
But uh, this is this is something we have to do though, because uh, the previous the previous approach, especially in this paper, is using heavy traffic solution. So uh, we did this, and we also explained that uh, the notion of optimality is different. The heavy traffic analysis is up, asymptotically optimal uh, when the system grows large. So the solution becomes close to the true optimal solution. But the online learning approach is scale free. It converges to the true optimal solution as the service experience accumulate by serving more and more customers. So, so it, actually the philosophies are a bit different. So does this give a little bit partial uh, feedback to your question? Uh, sure, yes. <laughs> Thank you. But a safe tier question, I think there's also uh, more recently, there's a lot more systems where this type of price experimentation can go on indefinitely, where the price is you know, built into the user interface and the user can check the price and make their decision. Yeah, I mean, by, I mean, mm -hmm. yes. And, and, the, but the world is changing on, and so on, right? In many of these practical application or right. the problem by, by then has changed, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so, so we also have an algorithm when lambda is unknown. So this is basically a KW estimator. So the um, so we assume that uh, so this there is a queuing economic perspective of this, right? So lambda can be considered a potential market size, and lambda p is the rate at which customers are willing to join under price p. You can explain that using a utility function where the customer's utility is greater than p, and the customer is willing to join. So, uh, so this lambda p would be decreasing function of p. We focus on the case where lambda is unknown, and we, we apply this online learning approach to it. So here is a quick uh, uh, explanation of this uh, Golic with an extension. We call that Golic with unknown demand, well, unknown, unknown arrival. Uh, the idea is very simple, right? KW algorithm. So in the case cycle, we split this into two halves. We run the GD1Q in the first half under P and we perturb it by a little bit, right? So perturb perturbation is delta K and we generate all this data and we take the difference of the two and then let it be divided by delta. This is the fundamental idea of a KW estimator, right? Uh, so and it's still going to be a SGD. So the estimator of the gradient is used here to update the price. And here is the learning, uh, learning rate eta. So we have four hyperparameters, uh, the length of the cycle, um, the delta, which is the perturbation of the decision, uh, and the eta k, which is the learning rate here, step size, and the uh, warm up time. So, these are the set of the parameters, hyperparameters that we, we use. And we under this, we're able to show the regret uh, is in the order of a square root of t times log of t. So it's a bit it's a bigger than the previous one. So the analysis follows similar uh, steps. We have to separate this into regret part one, regret part two, and we minimize the orders by selecting the optimal, uh, asymptotically optimal parameters for the problem. So uh, same example is used here to illustrate the convergence, right? So this is the MM, MM1Q having a logic uh, demand curve. Uh, so we have a convergence for the price sequence, the gradient is fluctuating around uh, zero and regret curve and also linear regression of it. So um, if you have two decisions, P and a mu, you can flip a coin in each case in each cycle to, to update one of them. For example, go back to, sorry to interrupt. Can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. So here the price looks extremely volatile, which I guess in at least some applications would be undesirable. Can you smooth it somehow to get similar regret without a volatile, without this really volatile price? Or do you think that's kind of, Mm, but the thing is, um, this using SGD, the learning rate. So right, so this is the learning rate or the step size. This is this is getting smaller and smaller. So 
the adjustment you apply on the decision is making a little and little uh, like smaller uh, impact on the overall objective. So even though the, the price sequence is more volatile and also you, you can see the gradient is not really close to zero. It's fluctuating above and, and below. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, what this means. It's hard to, to, to put it into context. Like this does, does not necessarily mean the bad thing. So, so I, I just don't have good insight in this. Like, do you think, do we think this is volatile or do we think this is stable? I'm just not, I, I don't have a concrete insight of this. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so, so uh, if you have two decisions, P and a mu, you can determine at each k uh, in each period k. You can determine you, you want to uh, you do you want to test p uh, p or do you want to update your mu, right? So you can do one at a time and by flipping a coin, you generate a random variable u and if it's less than a half or greater than a half, you know u is uniform distributed between between zero and one. So the idea is similar, right? So you you take this uh, k double algorithm with one of the two parameters adjusted. And here is an algorithm of um, the, the curve, um, um, uh, you know, um, the sequence of P and the mu, uh, the gradient of the two and the regret. So here uh, we are able to use a solver to, to, to compute the optimal P star and the mu star as a benchmark here, the, the red curve. Can you give some intuition why I have to estimate the gradients of these two things separately like why you don't have we... to you don't have to you can you can actually estimate them together this is just a one one uh so it's it's a facilitate our theoretical analysis a little bit okay you don't have to you don't have to this is basically saying that starting from a point p mu on a two-dimensional plane you're moving only vertically or horizontally you right. could move diagonally no problem yeah yeah it's just to facilitate the analysis i guess that that gets used with yeah where where how does that can you give at least high level intuition about how that helps with the analysis or like what difficulties moving at this same moving in no no, no 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 difficulty no difficulty we can handle that we can handle that you can you can do a more general uh, stochastic gradient descent okay no difficulty it's just we feel like you know we restrict ourselves in this in this uh, simpler version. It's it's help us to better write the proof. <laughs> That's all. Uh, okay. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. So to I see that we are over time. So to 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 summarize, we study a pricing and a capacity sizing problem for GG1Q. We have two algorithms developed for two cases. Lambda is known and lambda is unknown, and the algorithm is related to policy gradient method. If you if you put this into the context of reinforcement learning. There are several steps uh, in the next uh, ongoing uh, project. We want to relax the reinform uh, stability condition. We want to include more realistic customer behavior, such as abandonment and balking. We want to include more realistic server behavior, such as strategic agent. I know Sherwin has a paper uh, modeling uh, service behavior, ser uh, the server's um, utility function by taking into account the idle time and the uh, service cost. So we want to have a more model-free model for that. We also want to consider uh, other kind of queues uh, and other kind of decisions. Here is sort of service rate control and pricing control. We want to move on to study the other controls. So uh, should I stop now or, or do, do I still have a minute? I have one ex quick extension. I would just take one page. Yeah, sure. Uh, we have a couple okay. more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I just want I'll just spend one minute. So we we have a ongoing paper that is studying um, this setting with a uh, sharing economy flavor. Uh, for taking Uber as an example, we have we assume unknown demand rate from the rider side. We have an unknown uh, service capacity from the driver side. So so the so the demand rate from the rider side is controlled by a p, where lambda is assumed to be unknown function. And uh, the service capacity side is controlled indirectly by a wage of the driver. So the platform is solving this uh, double-sided pricing problem, taking the cut, the price difference between P and the W times the demand rate minus some kind of a customer delay cost minus server delay cost. So this is 
this is something we're working on right now to extend this to from the commercial queuing setting where the service provider has full knowledge of the service rate to uh, a more modern application where the service provider can only use a price or a wage to incentivize the service provider. And that's everything. Thanks so much. Thank you, Yunnan, for a wonderful talk. Thank you.